mug, 2016, March. When you're running that, is it a, it's a hangout on air, right? Is that um, an announcement? I oh. Didn't see it. I saw a regular hangout because the it won't broadcast it if you do a regular hangout. It when you join the hangout, it won't broadcast it. Right. It has to be hangout on air, and then you hit the broadcast now button. You hit the broadcast now button. No. Or start broadcast. I didn't see you had an option though for. Does it say it somewhere? It says hang out. It usually says something. Like that. So, for part of my talk, I'm going to be doing some scans on the network. If you would like to have your computer uh, participate in the scans, mm -hmm. then you can connect to that Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi is rainbow. The password is connection. Oh, is that your access point? Yeah. Excellent. That way, you'll still be able to get out to the internet and do whatever you normally want to do. It's just it separates it out from whoever doesn't want to participate. Another thing, uh, this is for educational use only. Uh, Should I you do this kind of stuff? <laughs> I'm going to say it again so uh, for the recording. Um, but uh, you know, anything I show you today, if you don't do it on your own network or you don't have explicit permission to do it, it is illegal and you can go to jail and or find some bad stuff. So we can't do anything that's not educationally related or we're going to go to jail? Or? Uh, if you follow these steps and, and purposely hack somebody for gain and profit, oh. then you can go to jail. <laughs> or if somebody can construe it for being... <laughs> it looks like it was... Right. So that uh, Microsoft uh, SQL is going to be mid-2017 availability. That's when it's going to be available? Yes. Mid-2017. They say that there's like a, a trial version available immediately. 15 months. Yeah, that is quite a ways off. Oh, well. I don't need it anyways. Darren, I was going to set up tomorrow. What if I do a free version? There was a long, uh, for a long time, there were rumors they were going to release a version of it for Linux. Well, I keep saying that. The, the thing is, 2017 gives them enough time to get people thinking about it. Yeah. I mean, because they are the ultimate. So, you know, one of the uh, conspiratorial thoughts would be that they're announcing to try and slow down the adoption of closer to Could be. Could be. Yeah. To, yeah to, but I, 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 this seems like a very different Microsoft, though, than will actually be good on that I don't think that's going to be the case. I just wonder if Linux has enough desktop to warrant that it's not like so. I doubt it unless they can pour it over to .NET. <laughs> Well, and they've got their Office 365 web base, yeah. so yeah. Have you used that? I've not. It's uh, it has it has some interesting issues. It'd be interesting to see if they ever try porting over like WPF, even though it's got so many folks into System 32 and how their operating system uh, runs. What is, what is WPF is their current uh, like graphical design. Again, most of their application, most of the application.
Does this Visual Studio code, which is in, like it's got some IntelliSense and like some JavaScript support baked in, but Visual Studio is, is still one of the most feature complete IDEs in the world today. So and then they also just joined the Eclipse Foundation, which is yeah. that's the that's the uh, web Eclipse. So the Microsoft web page to find out more is not available. What they need to do is host it on the page. Anybody here have experience with Nginx? I think it'd be great. I probably it's nice to have a presentation on it sometime, just to give us a get our feet wet. It's, it's I've not seen it. Compared to Apache, it's ridiculously easy to get set up. The virtual hosting setup is a lot. So it's basically, to it, you have a site configuration, and all you have to do to put that site live is simply get from one folder to another. It's, it's really I've been doing Apache for years and years and years. Yeah. It's still been for Well, even even yeah. proxy yeah. with an engine that bought this. So much for Jake. Really? Yeah. 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 I, I use HA proxy. Yeah. And then rewrites. Like what? Really well. yeah. Mob yeah. rewrite is a thing of the past. Yeah. Yeah, rewriting in there. It has its own work. And they use it. So a presentation on Nginx would be great. Oh, even a half a presentation. We're, we're setting it. It's broadcasting. Excellent. Should be. You rebooted and brought it all back up? No, I just took the hang out down and brought it back up. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. Are you ready, Tony? <laughs> uh, all right. It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Tony Bemis. He's going to talk on offensive security and countermeasures using Kali Linux. So take it away, Tony. <laughs> all right. Okay. So I'm Tony Bemis. Uh, I've been working in IT for 13 some years, and uh, just a, a whole range of, of roles from small business owner uh, working with small businesses to uh, enterprise level uh, networking. And I'm currently a master's student at Eastern Michigan University doing uh, uh, information assurance. Study. Uh, I'm both my master's in, in information assurance uh, for network security. Uh, so it, it, my last class was actually it was it was top or titled offenses, um, <laughs> offensive security and countermeasures. So it made me it made me interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, also because I missed all the meetings last semester, they uh, kind of roped me into talking about it for, <laughs> for tonight. <laughs> Uh, so basically, I'm going to go through and talk about uh, what uh, a general IT security uh, professional has to consider, uh, the type of attacks that are available, uh, and how to um, how to keep your sa yourself safe. Uh, also, I'll, I'll show you a couple of those attacks and, and what to do to keep uh, from being a target. So, the information in this uh, presentation is for educational use only. Uh, if you are going to do any of this, you need to be doing it on your own network. If you do it on anybody else's without explicit permission, uh, it is illegal. So, don't be evil. <laughs> do you see typos? No, I got a question. Is this presentation 
available on your site, or is it going to be available to membership? Or is it yeah, it's it's available to the public right now. It's on the previous hosting. Yep. The previous okay. hosting. Okay. If you go to bemishosting.com slash security, it'll be the current top um, post, and we'll stay there uh, until forever, if I can help it. <laughs> Carl? Yeah, when you talk about getting permission, something that's not really obvious is you might have someone from IT in a company hire you to come in and do a scan, and then find yourself in court because nobody from the administration approved that. And they'll exactly. say that the IT person did not have the authority to hire you to do pen testing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. not only do you want to get permission, but you want to get permission from the right parties. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Good yeah, point. so you need to get all parties that uh, have a stake in what you're testing against. You need to make sure that everybody is, uh, is approval and has signed off on it. Uh, like you said, from administration to IT to um, lawyers to everybody, you know, make sure it's legally binding because just walking up and have somebody shake your hand and say it's okay to go <laughs> typically doesn't hold up. Again, don't be evil. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so <coughs> offensive security. It's a proactive and an adversarial approach to uh, protecting your network uh, and systems and individuals inside it. Uh, and adversarial, meaning that you're going to sit there and act like you're a hacker or think how they're doing it. That way you can understand what they're doing and how to protect against yourself against it. And countermeasures is pretty much a security control. You know, it's something that's uh, deployed and put in place to um, keep yourself secure. One thing that the security professionals are taught is the CIA triad. Uh, and it's you have to think about these three spot, or, uh, points when on anything security related. It's confidentiality, keeping things uh, hidden from people that shouldn't be getting to it. Uh, availability is if you have it too secure and people can't get to it, then what's the point? Uh, and integrity is making sure that uh, it's uh, uh, that it's accurate and complete um, uh, all the data and the systems that you're working with. Uh, so that's where a lot of people say, well, why don't you just make it secure and nobody can get into it? Well, you can <laughs> unplug it from the network, but then nobody can get into it. So that's not really a feasible option. Uh, another all right, so what I consider is some of the top things to make sure you keep yourself safe are you want to, if you're running a window system, make sure you have uh, antivirus or, or malware, and a malware. Uh, use strong passwords and, uh, uh, and unique passwords for every system that you touch. Uh, so using a, a password manager helps with that. And uh, to have unique passwords for you know, 20 different systems becomes difficult. But if you think about how many other websites that you log into on even a yearly basis, it gets becomes unmanageable. So that's why you need a password manager. And uh, I, I just set up uh, LastPass uh, a couple months ago, and I love it. It's working pretty good for me. Uh, the KeePass is the open source version, or KeePass X. And, but there's a little bit more work on getting it to sync between devices and, and things like that. So that's why I went with uh, LastPass. Uh, the other, the next big thing is to install security patches and updates. That's something that you need to do on any system that's that's out there. No, no matter if it's Windows or Linux or Mac or embedded devices like routers and, uh, and IoT. Internet of targets. <laughs> um, you know, whenever a patch comes out, you need to get it installed. And that's where one of the problems with cell phones are coming up is that if it's an older phone that's not supported anymore, that in older, as in like three years or older, then the, your cell phone company doesn't want to work on sending out a new patch. They just want you to buy a new phone. So now you have 
a computing device that you carry around with you all the time. You have lots of personal data on it, and it's vulnerable to attacks. So that's, uh, that's something that you really need to keep in mind. Uh, make sure you keep your stuff packed up. You know, it's multiple times. The 321 policy is what I uh, apply to. It's uh, three copies, two, no, one, two, three back. Yeah. I don't know. It just make sure you have multiple copies in multiple places. And that's, uh, it will be, keep you safe. Uh, and then make sure you have a uh, firewall set up on your system. Because uh, just because you have a, uh, you're up on your patches, doesn't mean that there's a zero day flaw that attack can use. Uh, so a, a firewall can help against some of that stuff too. Uh, Oversharing on the internet and on social networks, that's a big problem with, uh, especially kids today. You, know, you gotta, everybody needs to make sure that the more info you put out there, then it's more that uh, attackers can figure out you know, where you're saving things, what uh, passwords you're using, things like that. Even though you might not think much of it, it's, it's better just to pull back a little bit. Uh, and drive encryption. You know, it's, if you lose your flash drive, and somebody picks it up and throws it in their computer, now all of your personal data is theirs. So, Kali Linux is the one of the most popular uh, uh, offensive security or uh, advanced penetration systems for Linux, uh, Linux distros. Uh, the reason they're really good is because there's over 600 tools that are available within Kali. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, you know it's it's been a, around a few years named as Kali, but even before that, it was called Backtrack Linux. And that's been the uh, uh, distro of choice for a long time, too, for this stuff. Um, recently, they moved on to uh, Debian-based with uh, GNOME 3 is the latest version, 2.0 point something. Uh, <coughs> and uh, now they support ARM devices, so you can run it on your Raspberry Pi or, or other uh, small embedded um, so you can see here is, is a screenshot of it, and uh, there's a set of tools coming along down here. There's a list of 13 items, and under each one of those are just tools on top of tools on top of tools. So it's uh, more than what the average person can just go through and figure out what they all do, let alone use them. Uh, so today I'm just going to cover a couple of them. And then, uh, you know, YouTube is a good uh, source for figuring out how a lot of these tools work. So you type in the tool and uh, Kelly, and it'll bring up somebody else that's demonstrating how to use it. Uh, you can do custom ISOs of Kelly. Uh, you can install it onto your system. So if you want just a base install with a few tools instead of all 600, uh, say if you're running it on a Raspberry Pi and you don't have much space, then you install the base Kali Linux, and then you do an apt-get Kali Linux dash, and then see if you're doing software design defining radios, it's SDR. Or if you do just wireless testing, it's you know dash wireless, uh, web forensics, VoIP. You know there's a lot of them, and then more of the top ten tools that they include in there. This is all available on the Kali website at kali.org. Uh, so the top 10 tools are listed here. It's uh, AirPack and G, which is used for cracking Wi-Fi passwords. Uh, Burp Suite, which is an SQL injection uh, research tool where you can go through, you pick out a site, and then you can have it search the site. And uh, there's, there's different tools where you you can uh, go through and edit the HTML and then have it send that back or, or SQL queries against that site. And uh, it'll 
tell you whether it's vulnerable to certain attacks. Um, Hydra is uh, an online password cracking tool. A lot of times Hydra and Burp, uh, Burp Suite is used together to find the SQL uh, vulnerability and then run the password attack against it. Uh, John is a John the Ripper, a uh, brute force password. So if you grab a password file off of a system, like the uh, uh, shadow directory or shadow file or uh, uh, the, in Windows, the SAM file out of the registry, and you can run John the Ripper against it. But you have to you supply the file plus a dictionary file and it'll search through the whole file and try to grab out the key, or the uh, password for you. <coughs> uh, Maltigo is a research and reconnaissance tool. I was going to try to show that today, but it's not coming up for some reason. There's uh, something hanging on my, the, the way I'm doing the live boot, and it won't launch for me. So I will tell you a little bit about it, but I uh, won't be able to demonstrate it today. Metasploit is one of the most popular ones we're going to be showing. I'll be showing that to you today. That's the, uh, it's a whole framework of, um, to go from, um, you know, finding the uh, uh, exploit to creating a payload for it to um, accepting or to running the exploit and accepting a, a connection back to you. Uh, and it, it involves uh, payloads from all sorts of uh, um, vulnerabilities that are available out there. So things like uh, cross-site script, uh, cross scripting uh, uh, er er attacks and things like that. Uh, Nmap. Everybody's heard of Nmap. Uh, so I'll be demonstrating a little bit about Nmap. It's where you can do some uh, network scanning and pulling out info about the uh, devices that are connected to your network. Uh, ZA proxy, or ZAP, yeah, ZA proxy, is finding vulnerabilities in web applications. Uh, SQL map is uh, another detecting and exploiting SQL injections. And Wireshark is a very popular one for doing uh, network capture, packet captures and uh, sniffing the wire. Um, it's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so the first one I'm gonna I'm gonna demonstrate is a uh, Android RAT and uh, with using the Metasploit framework. And what a RAT is is it's a remote access trojan or tool that you get the uh, unsuspecting person to install it, and it, uh, depending on the payload you, you send to it, which is the one we're going to use, it will make a connection back to you, and then you can have root access, shell access into the device. Uh, so after we go through all this, I'll show you how, hopefully, if it works right, I'll show you that we have access uh, but to be able to keep yourself secure against it is to keep up on security patches and be vigilant for everything you install. If you're going to install things outside of the, uh, the App Store or the Google Play, uh, you need to be very careful where it comes from and that it's a, uh, a vetted app. Um, this so only works on mobile devices that have PCs? This, this particular. Uh, one I'm going to show. Yeah, so I have an old uh, phone here. It's an Android uh, HTC Evo 3D. It hasn't been updated in years. <laughs> uh, probably four years. Uh, so I'm guessing that it's vulnerable to this. Uh, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to test it. So we'll see. Uh, or is it just disabled to get in without even a map being No, 
this one that I'm going to show you, you have to get somebody to install the APK file. So there's, there's a few things that have to be in place. The person has to turn on installing things outside of the uh, App Store. Uh, you have to send it to them, convince them that it's something they need to install. Um, so uh, usually social engineering is needed for this. Uh, and so you can send it either via the email and have them click on and open up and install it. You know, said, tell them that it's, it's a new screensaver or mm -hmm. a uh, flashlight app they need to install. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or you can post it on a website somewhere you know, to get random people to try to click on it and run it. your IP address is because the attack will call back to you to give you access. So we know it's uh, 192.168.5.103. There's certain ports that this app can use to set up port forwarding so that it calls back your particular machine. Yes, exactly. Uh, as I'll show you, or you may have seen in the previous, you, there is a port selection that you put in there. And so you specify where it's coming back to. And that's where you can open up your firewall ports and have just that one port come in. So anybody that's running or that comes a victim then we'll be connecting back to you. In this case, we're not doing that. We're doing everything on a, a private wireless network that I have a little router sitting down here on the floor. Um, so that's why I'm using my internal private address. If you were to do this on the public, I'm sure you'd figure out how to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what I just asked you, basically. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't use your private address. No. Uh, so before I run this, I will explain which one. Okay. So he's saying, run the Metasploit Venom tool. Dash P is for the payload, which is Android Meterpreter Reverse TCP. This is the payload that is will create a TCP connection back to you. So you're telling it the local host is my IP address, you know where to come back to. The uh, local port, which this is what you're asking about, what port to use. I'm using 4444, and we're going to pipe that into the APK file. So you're, you're building a package to be installed on somebody's Android phone. Exactly. And it contains the phone home address and port. Yep. <clears throat> okay, and then you're going to go install that on your phone. Exactly. Yeah, I'm going to change hats from <laughs> the attacker to the unsuspecting right. victim. <coughs> Are you missing the R from the yeah. interpreter? I thought it was meter Peter. Alright, so it says it created it's a eight meg file. 
going to yeah, he came to us.